So, I've been out here in England for about a week. I've done the canine cognition seminar and we'll be doing the odor pay seminar. But one of the things I just got to do was go visit the West Midland Police Dog Training Center, which is about two hours or so outside of London. This police canine training center is also a place that has its own breeding program. This breeding program provides the dogs throughout this entire region which is 250 plus dogs uh, through their breeding program. I did an interview with Dave Hibbert who is the chief instructor at the training center. We discussed their breeding program, the success they have, and how they do some of the things they do. Now in the United States it's still quite a debate about whether or not we should have a breeding program. There's the AKC Puppy to Patriot program. There is a few other, I would say, groups or nonprofits, etc., that want to do or have done breeding programs. We do need to find ways to be more self sufficient. And in the past 90 days, I've been to Switzerland, and now I've been here in the UK, and both countries have breeding programs and they have the officers raise the dogs from puppies. Now in some cases it's the training center like out here in England that raise the puppies, train them and prepare them for the handlers and in Switzerland it's the handler who raises their puppy and then becomes a police dog. Both programs have a high success rate. So in this interview with Dave you guys will get to hear what they do, how they do it, but I want it to be a conversation piece for those of us who in the United States see the same thing, that we need to find ways to have programs that help us breed, raise, and select dogs to become police dogs. We need to find some level of self-sufficiency and just like these programs in Europe and in the UK, we can learn lessons from them and be better and find ways to be successful versus coming up with all the reasons why we say we can't do it because I'm pretty sure we can it just takes some collaboration some information sharing and trial and error we will have to have some failures in order to be successful so I hope you find this video uh, enjoyable but also informative and maybe even thought-provoking and as usual please like and subscribe and join the Ford K9 channel here on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, hello, my name is Dave Hibbert. I'm the Chief Instructor of West Midlands Police Dog Unit. Um, so I oversee all of the um, breeding, training uh, and kenneling of our uh, operational and young police dogs here. Okay, and it's a mixture of detection dogs and what you guys call a GP or patrol dogs, correct? Yeah, so our patrol dogs uh, mm -hmm. are called general purpose mm -hmm. police dogs. Uh, so there are uh, tracking dogs, searching dogs, uh, biting dogs, um, and then our detection dogs go through a whole host of odours uh, from explosives, drugs, firearms, cash, digital media, blood, cadaver. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our detection dogs uh, all work in different specialisms to, to find things. Mm -hmm. And with, and on the general purpose dogs, um, I guess I'll go with how many dogs do you guys provide out of your breeding program? How many dogs are you guys providing annually? Um, so we breed uh, a mix of, of patrol and detection dogs. Uh, so we breed 17 litters a year. Okay. Um, probably 10 of those litters are for general purpose mm -hmm. dogs uh, and seven litters uh, for our detection dogs. Um, so it's probably, um, probably more general purpose dogs and detection dogs mm -hmm. uh, we produce. Uh, we have uh, 55 operational uh, general purpose police dogs here uh, mm -hmm. within the West Midlands. Uh, but then our puppy development program obviously ensures we've got a supply of, of dogs coming through, um, but also then to other forces um, and government agencies uh, here in the UK uh, and some dogs uh, also overseas to government agencies mm -hmm. as well. And out of, let's say, I'll go with the 10 litters a year that you have with your general purpose dogs, 
what would you say the percentage is that make it from the breeding program out to being operational? Yeah, so we, we're really good. So our breeding program has been going for, for many years uh, now. So the facility here was uh, built and developed in 95. Okay. Um, so we've got a long track record of, of really good genetics. Um, and then also our training program for puppies is constantly being tweaked and developed. Uh, so our success rate is up into the 90%, wow. uh, 92% of, of our dogs. Uh, go on to be operational working dogs, um, either for us or other government agencies. Mm -hmm. And what about from the detection side? It's roughly the same. Okay. Um, so across the board, we've got high um, success rate. So our detection dogs um, have historically always been Springer Spaniels, mm -hmm. um, but we've just started to add uh, Cocker Spaniels mm -hmm. uh, and Labradors mm -hmm. into that program uh, as well. So we're in early days with the, the Cockers and Labradors. And how have you seen it with Cockers? How they've been doing with the breeding program? Cocker, I, 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 they're kind of my little favorite dogs. Sure. So I work at an explosive search dog, which is a Cocker Spaniel. So I'm a little bit biased sure. uh, around that question. Um, but yeah, we've got some really good genetics, mm -hmm. uh, Cocker Spaniel wise. Um, so they're coming through the program program now and, mm -hmm. and just starting to to filter in um so i am a little bit biased sure historically spring spaniels has been our mainstay of, yeah. of search dogs uh, we've got a fantastic record with with springer spaniels mm -hmm. um and cocker spaniels just bring something a little bit different for little um mm -hmm. you know areas we work in and then the same with the labradors as well so um, for passive people screening yeah. and things like that the labradors offer us a different capability and what would you, how would you say the are the labs doing pretty well too? Or what's been the I would say the hardest thing when looking at this and, and creating yeah, this program? The, the labs is the labs quite interesting. So we've only just started breeding labs uh, probably 12, 12 months ago. So okay. we're just starting to get the first batch of, of Labradors through. Um, so that's quite an interesting project we've we've worked on really. And there are some little subtle differences around the way we've developed them and, and just tweaking things uh, as we go. So at the moment, the, the success rate of our labs is we're just starting to see the results of, of that program. Um, and then we'll make any changes we need um, some of, from some of the stuff you're going to talk to sure. about as well. Cameron, so, um, so yeah, we're really excited to see how the, the, the cockers and the labs um, sort of pitch themselves against the, the Spaniels, the mm. Springer Spaniels we've had such good success rates with his historically. So the personal screening with the dogs, you guys have had that for a while now. Um, like I said, we have it for explosives dogs in the States, but it's not very common like you guys do for narcotics. So Yeah, so we've got um, passive screening dogs uh, for our uh, narcotics here. Um, so we've actually recently just run a course um, to uplift the number of dogs we've got, which has got that capability. So they're really good for our transport networks, our buses, uh, trains, um, airports etc um so yeah we've got a long-standing record of, of our passive uh drugs narcotic detection mm -hmm. dogs uh and you know here in the uk the, there's lots of forces that that do that the the met uh, in london and obviously the british transport police have got um, some real good dogs with good success rates of those passive capabilities and um, which is one of the reasons why we looked at labs and those slightly taller dogs which mm -hmm. give us um just hopefully an enhanced capability to be able to um, to offer a, a better service to. Has that been an issue? Because that gets brought up from time to time is, oh, a dog's height is an issue, but you guys have had some good, I mean, I, I, I look at it as the height isn't really a significant problem, but. No, I think height breeds the whole conversation around which dog is better. A good dog is a good dog. It's exactly. a job it's trained and designed to do. So, you know, we've got, uh, small Springer Spaniels as passive drugs dogs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, historically, we've had an Irish Water Spaniel uh, as a passive drugs dog, which was equally as good. Mm -hmm. Was the height an advantage, or was it just a good dog? Yeah, it is so, the question, yeah. the golden nugget, isn't it? But um, I, I think also the perception piece is quite important. So when you're working with with uh, people and people screening, I think the labs sometimes give you a more friendlier mm -hmm. um, perception piece for, for the public so uh, uh, springers can be a little bit manic and jumpy and mm -hmm. you know some of the height things so I, I don't think it's a question of, of height for one yeah. dog or not a good dog is a good dog yep. um, regardless of breed and size and, and uh, the capability is mm -hmm. the most important part for us yeah no and you guys also do like you mentioned the various specialties such as blood digital um, obviously human remains aspect of it um, digital is something that's newer and near and dear to my heart now too. 
Um, how much has that grown for you guys as a program? Did, digital is really interesting. Uh, there's lots of different opinions on, on digital and how mm -hmm. to train it and how to use the dogs. Uh, so we've got two digital uh, mm -hmm. detection dogs here at the West Midlands. Um, and that is becoming, you know, an ever increasing capability yep. for, for us, um, from a, from an evidence gathering perspective. So, mm -hmm. um, we've had some really good results with, with our dogs. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, you know, something we're still learning about. Yes. Something we're, you know, the, the more investigations you can do, the mm -hmm. more times the dog works, the more we can start to develop our training and capabilities of the dogs. And I think, I think it's important with all dog training, we stay open-minded, we listen to people and we take on board mm -hmm. feedback from other people who are doing it and, and listen to other practitioners and which makes us all better at sure. what we do. So yeah, the digital media stuff is, is a, you know, a real good asset for us as a, yeah. as a force and a capability. Yep. With the growth, um, or as detection dogs develop, um, Obviously, the common ones is narcotic, explosive, things of that nature. What would you say is, I'll take HR out of it too because that's pretty well established. What would you say is the newest, most used or growing field in detection for you guys? Um, I, well, one of the things we're, we're looking at around our detection dogs is uh, capability of a semen detection dog. Mm -hmm. um, so we've spent some time with our colleagues over in Holland mm -hmm. at the Sense School in Nunsby who, who've got the dogs. Um, we've got a couple of forces in the UK with those dogs. Uh, and again, from an evidence uh, gathering perspective for us, the more we can use dogs and, and mm -hmm. the, the abilities of our dogs to help um, gather evidence and put puzzles together to to be able to find you know, you know people and suspects then the better so um, we're looking at semen uh, mm -hmm. detection dog um, and then one of the other things we we spend a lot of time doing is searching for missing vulnerable people um, so we're currently looking at uh, a sent article method search dog uh, combined with an open search dog for for missing people mm -hmm. um, that is a big part of uh, what we do mm -hmm. uh, to support our colleagues across the force, uh, having a dedicated dog, which has got that capability, would be a really important. Yeah, for the evidence so, collection, uh, especially yeah. with now, are you guys doing like Nunspeed, where you have the human scent that is, let's say, I think it's 24 or 48 hours old, and it focuses on that and can ignore older scent. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at a range of stuff at the moment. So the, the missing person uh, capability we're looking at is, is obviously to go out and find people, hopefully before they get to mm -hmm. the point we need yeah. HR dogs, yeah. uh, really. Um, and I think that's the important thing for us at the moment is is focusing on trying to, you know, put as much resource in we, we, as we can to, mm -hmm. to finding people at their most vulnerable point. Um, and if we can use dogs to do that and, and get people... To, to safety, then that's that's our kind of focus yeah. for the next project yeah. for us detection wise. Yeah, with the puppies. So you guys breed the puppies here. They're whelped. You guys keep them till about like you saying earlier about twelve weeks old, and then they go to. You guys actually have a raising program. Right? Yeah, we do. Um, so we've had uh, a, a real long standing breeding program here. Um, we've got probably I think one of the biggest breeding programs and puppy development programs, um, certainly probably across Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and a really successful one at that. So um, all of our dogs come through our puppy development program. So they start here um, mm -hmm. in our birthing centre. Um, we run the early neurostimulation program. So we've mm -hmm. taken some of the things from the Taglias uh, yep. super dog program. Um, we've added some things and developed some things as we've we've gone over the years. Mm -hmm. We've done this. Um, so we keep the dogs here till they're roughly between ten and twelve weeks old. Um, so we have a trainer here who looks after the puppies, uh, imprints them on ragging, mm -hmm. you know, playing with toys. Uh, and then we have a, a, a really successful fostering program where uh, members of the public will then take our dogs uh, home. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll look after the dogs for us for roughly 12 months um, and follow a very structured puppy development program, mm -hmm. um, which is all around making sure the dogs are environmentally sound yep. so they take them everywhere bus stations shopping centers slippery floors mm -hmm. open stairs all the places the dogs would have to work operationally so our number one criteria for our volunteers is to produce a dog who's confident yeah. everywhere yep. um, the second most important thing for us then is that desire to work uh, and, and is motivated with with toys and engagement um, and then the third thing we look for from, from our program, uh, and we call it learning to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so the third component is around the problem solving dog. 
uh, Adobe is able to, to problem solve, think for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst they are highly motivated for a toy, we do lots of exercises um, around their cognitive ability to, mm -hmm. to problem solve and think. Uh, and that's as important for our patrol dogs as it is for our detection dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the three key areas. Uh, our volunteers follow that program. Um, and come back regularly here for training, as you've seen today. Yeah, uh, we've got a whole bunch of uh, members of the public here with their dogs, um, having some coaching, having some development, um, and in turn, then then being able to develop our dogs for us. And how how do you guys go about selecting your volunteers to help raise the dogs? Because we know there's that nature and nurture aspect to this. Yeah. They play a major role in that nurture. So how do you go about selecting the right person? To yeah, raise a dog and be it's successful. One hundred percent. It's a really, really good question. So we we place a lot of emphasis on on developing people. Uh, so not just our staff, but also the people who help us with our with our dogs. Um, so we go through quite a robust recruitment process. We run lots of information sessions where we kind of explain what we do. They come here for a session. Um, so before they even have the dog, they mm -hmm. come to a couple of sessions here. One about the program. One about training. Um, and then throughout the program, they'll come back regularly for some classroom inputs on kind of dog behavior and dog training. Mm -hmm. And then as you've seen today, practical sessions um, around actually physically training the dog and working the dog and doing exercises with the dog from there. Yeah. The, how, I guess, like I said, it's pretty stringent to become a raiser of these puppies. Um, I would say, would you say the success rate is pretty high for that or is it somebody like i guess picking people for it does it help having somebody who has working dog knowledge <laughs> versus just somebody who wants to come out and do that yeah, it's or, or is there like category like people that are do such a rescue are really good at it or it's, yeah it's really difficult it's um it, it's a really difficult um conundrum around that because um we like to raise our dogs in a in a certain way we like them mm -hmm. to follow our program and that's not saying our program's the best and every other program is is the worst sure and we're the best but we do like people to follow our program because it helps us if we get a problem with the dog mm -hmm. we hopefully know how that problem's arisen which helps helps us to to kind of undo it and, and reconstruct it and sometimes people who've got previous experience with other dogs and mm -hmm. previous experience from other backgrounds um, can sometimes come and put their own spin on things. Mm -hmm. So when the dogs come here for assessments or training mm -hmm. and they do something, it's very difficult then for us to find, well, how on earth is the dog yeah. to this program? So th it's a mix, really. Um, we've got a mix of people, some people who've never had dogs before ever in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, through to people who've had um, working trials dogs and, and things like that. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think the experience and exposure per se doesn't play a huge part we haven't found okay. one or the other i think the key to all good dog training is mm -hmm. open-mindedness mm -hmm. um taking people's feedback and listening to different ideas and and developing that into our training which is which is why we we try and put so much into people to try and educate them and yeah. share ideas and, and similarly people from other backgrounds bring ideas to us which mm -hmm. we can then implement into our training so i, I think the key thing is around all of the individuals here that are involved, whether it's our volunteers or our staff, are mm -hmm. open-minded people. Yeah, they're willing to listen to people's ideas um, and share ideas in the right yeah. way. Yeah, and I think that's the key component to it: is picking the people who are open-minded, mm -hmm. willing, and and wanting to mm -hmm. learn. Um, I think is the key to success for for all dog training. Yeah, for sure. If, if With the um, so, at typically, what age do your detection dogs? leave their razors and start training here at the training center so a, a bit of both as, as the program develops so the dogs uh, go out to our families um and then we bring them in for training mm -hmm. um so we have a 16 week uh, assessment a six month assessment a nine month assessment and a 12 month assessment and as part of those assessment blocks the dogs will come into here into our training department they'll spend a couple of weeks with us uh, and our trainers will do things with the dogs whilst they're here to send them on the journey, whether okay. it's a patrol dog or a detection dog. Um, and then at roughly 12 months old, they'll leave their families mm -hmm. um, that have looked after them for 12 months. They'll come into our training centre, and that's when they'll start the kind mm -hmm. of more um, intensive training course mm -hmm. with a dedicated uh, police instructor or trainer. And with that, I guess during the assessment stage, 
um, you were kind of also selecting what that dog might go do. Yeah, okay. yeah. So all of those assessments will will look: is the dog on track to graduating from the the puppy development program? Mm -hmm. um, do we need to put any measures in place to help the dog to train the dog? Does the dog need to come in here more often to have some structured training here mm -hmm. in the, the training centre? Um, and then yeah, looking at the dog's characteristics to see you know which route we're going to go down. Mm -hmm. Certainly from a detection perspective um, and what capabilities the dog's got yeah um, or, or whether or not it's a, a dog we can look at you know if there's another police force looking for dogs we can start to earmark those dogs and say well actually this dog would suit mm -hmm. this particular police force based on their policing requirements in their, yeah. their county the once the dog enters, let's say it's, it's the structured detection dog discipline, what's the average course length? And I know they're going to vary depending on what the skill is. What would you say the average train time is? Now, when they come to that, are they assigned a handler at that point? Or do you guys yeah. do training first and then give them to the handler? Yeah, so there's, there's, two, there's two kind of journeys for, for okay. the dogs, really. So generally, our detection dog, uh, most of our courses are, are anything between 10 and 13 weeks okay. long. Um, so generally, what would happen, the dog would be partnered with the police dog handler, mm -hmm. uh, who would then go on to a training course. Uh, mm -hmm. And on that training course, uh, the dogs would then um, be partnered with the handler, go on to the training course, and spend 10 to 13 weeks with, with the training course mm -hmm. uh, from, from there. Um, yep. We have also got, so in, in the force here, so one of the things, if we've got five police dog handlers on a training course, that's a lot of time they're spending away from being police yes. officers. Um, so we have an in-house program where the dogs will finish the puppy development program and then five dogs will be partnered with uh, an instructor and a trainer. Okay. Uh, they would train the dog, they would get the dog up to an accreditation standard so that when the dog handler comes off the streets, mm -hmm. you don't abstract them for 13 weeks because the dog's already trained and yeah. ready to go. Um, so from an efficiency basis, yeah. that's a much better process for us to go through than taking five dog handlers off the street mm -hmm. for 13 weeks yeah. and not being a police officer. Have you seen it be better as far as actually results to where, to, you know, because there's always the argument of, well, it's better for a person to start from zero and learn how the dog was trained versus taking a person, giving them a trained dog, and off they go. You know, my experience is it's been better having the trainer, the professional, train the dog up to a level, then hand it off to the handler and allow them to grow that last little bit together. Yeah. That's okay. But as we both kind of probably know, I, that's so I'm curious to hear your opinion on it, that handler, when they're new, they're not remembering half of the stuff in that beginning stage anyway. Yeah. So has is it something uh, similar? hundred percent. And and I think you know this is a really new concept for us. Um, so we were really in the early stages. But I, I agree with you. I, I think having somebody who's who's never been a dog handler before, never because we take police officers who are just good police officers. Mm -hmm. And we give them a dog to make them an even better police officer. Um, so a lot of people who come into the dog unit perhaps haven't had dog experience, a lot of dog experience, not a lot of dog training experience. So to try and get somebody with a green dog with really good characteristics, but also needs teaching, mm -hmm. with a police officer who also needs teaching, and you put the two together, um, it's a very, very difficult yeah. journey to, to go on. Mm -hmm. So from an efficiency basis, um, having a product which is which is ready to go, it's it's trained, and the person just needs to learn how to use the dog mm -hmm. to the best ability to make the person an even better yeah. police dog is, I, I believe, the, yeah. the the better way to go. Um, and then I also think it it also helps if we hit problems when the dog is is operational. Mm -hmm. um, so if the dog starts to have problems in training. We know exactly how the dog's being constructed mm -hmm. from the moment the dog's been born yes. all the way through to, to its training um, and accreditation. So if we hit a problem, we can bring it back in, we can mm -hmm. we can recreate, the, the almost re-engineer the dog, yeah. get the dog back out on the street and, and get people out functioning to the highest level they yeah. can. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer in the dog trainers do the dog training, mm -hmm. the police dog handlers who are very good police officers mm -hmm. are the people who are out there protecting and, and saving yep. lives. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the concept yeah. of having a green dog and a green handler together, it works and yeah. we've done it for years yep. and, and we've had really good successes, but yep. is it the most efficient yeah. use of resource? No, um, no, that's in so this much day and age when there's pressure on 
you know, finances and resources and time of police mm-hmm. officers, is it, are they better off being police officers and the dog training is done by mm-hmm. the dog training people? And if they get interested in it later on, then they can find themselves, you know, making a career <laughs> change. Yeah. Yeah. And becoming a trainer. And, and that's, I think that's the key bit because you'll have really good police dog handlers who are excellent police officers and excellent mm-hmm. police dog handlers mm-hmm. and are excellent at protecting members of the public. Um, and then those that have got a real interest in the training and the instructional side, get development uh, as a career path for them to to transition across at the time mm-hmm. uh, that's right um, but not every person will be good at dog training and not every person will be good at yeah instructing yeah but we'll identify those people and and you know develop them into that role yeah. uh, if they're suitable for it the one of the biggest things that gets brought up frequently in the united states is um well it's better for us to buy adult dogs because we won't waste as much time or money on trying to raise a police dog. Now, at the surface, I agree. Many agencies do not have the ability or the cap- or the understanding of how to raise. Yeah. But some of the bigger agencies may be investing, and NYPD has started doing this like you guys are now, um, doing the raise, you know, breeding, raising the dogs. Um, the it's what you you gave the stats that there's a high success rate yeah um many say oh the success rate isn't that well and what would you attribute because like you said you don't buy adult dogs too often now do you no yeah no. so what was what made the switch for you guys to go from purchasing let's say adult dogs to now doing it this way and what have you seen has been the big positive yeah i, I it, it, it's a really interesting debate around raising and buying adult dogs so i used to work for a different police force mm-hmm. before i joined here uh, and we actually bought a mix of adult dogs and, and puppies in because we didn't need the number of, of dogs so yeah we've got 55 police dog handlers here um so we we need quite a high turnover of dogs other police forces have only got 10 dog mm-hmm. handlers um, so for them to gamble on the success of a puppy for a small number is, is quite a big gamble, sure. but certainly for us, um, over the years we've been doing it and the tweaks we've been able to make to our breeding, genetics, health testing, performance testing, and then the puppy development side, we're quite a well-oiled machine, machine now. Yeah. now. Um, whereas I think, the, uh, and the benefit then for smaller forces to to buy adult dogs is we can provide an adult dog that's come through our program and we benefit from the economies of scale and the efficiencies mm-hmm. that that brings um so if you're a you know a force to put in the infrastructure we've got here in this day and age would be really expensive and, and sure costly um but for us the puppy program really works mm-hmm. um we're able to forward plan we know exactly what dogs we've got coming through the program we've got dogs ready and waiting so mm-hmm. if you know we have an accident with a dog that mm-hmm. means it needs to retire mm-hmm. we know we've got another dog that can easily slot in we haven't yep. got a police officer then waiting months mm-hmm. to find a dog or weeks for a course to start so for us the the puppy raising program really works for us um but i think that is down to our size yep. uh, and the size of our unit and 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 actually the the foresight of our senior management team and our executive team to to really invest in us and see the benefits of of what we bring and the efficiencies a breeding program mm-hmm. brings, which means we haven't got police officers not being police officers. Yeah. We can give them a dog quite right quickly away. And, and get them working. What would you say is the, you know, detection dog training has evolved a lot in the past, let's say, decade or so. Um, what are some of the things that's, that you've seen, because you've been doing it now long enough, the evolution in detection training or methodology that you guys now do here? Yeah, we... we Detection stuff is is a really fascinating thing. uh, And again, I think it goes back to the the comment I made earlier about being open-minded and looking at at things. Um, So, you know, we've been excellent at at detection dog training for for a long time, but that doesn't mean to say we stick at what we've we've just been doing for years because the famous phrase, well, we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're we're quite open about stealing people's ideas and developing things internally. So... Um, as I said, we spent some time over in Holland in, in Nunspeak with their mm-hmm. scent school. They're very good to us and showed us some things. Um, obviously, the, the Tobias mm-hmm. Gustafsson and, mm-hmm. and the, the, the Kong 
methodology, mm-hmm. which is similar the British military have been using mm-hmm. for, for a very, very long time successfully. Um, so I think it's all about that conversation around yeah. picking little bits and pieces mm-hmm. and, and developing something which kind of works for, mm-hmm. for us as a department yeah. um, and our detection dogs. So there's lots of things that... that kind of come and go and mm-hmm. develop and mm-hmm. I think it's about being as I say being really open minded yeah. and, and sharing ideas as well you know we have lots of people have you seen today we've had people from other yeah. UK police forces in mm-hmm. here we've got other overseas visitors that come and look at what we do um, and they'll take away some of the things we do and think it's brilliant and they'll sure. take away some things and think oh my god we're never going to do, do that, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's dog training isn't yes. it? and that's that open minded piece I think you, yeah. you know everybody can take something yeah. away whether you think Oh, actually what we're doing is pretty good or mm-hmm. or still a little bit of that or mm-hmm. develop that so mm-hmm. yeah i think there's lots of stuff around detection dog training at the moment which is which is really good mm-hmm. uh, you know some of the stuff you talk about with the, the puppies and mm-hmm. um you know how we identify the dog's characteristics it's yeah. not always just about training and training methodology it's around actually looking at what is the dog in front of you and yes and then being able to adapt whatever methodology it is you're using because it, it doesn't work for every dog. You got it. Um, and that's the, the one thing here we, you know, with our breeding program and the number of dogs we've got, they're not all robotic and they're not all the same. Mm-hmm. Everyone's got a different character. Everyone's motivated by something different. So for us, it's about being able to adapt different methodologies mm-hmm. to suit the dog we've got in Correct. front of us. Uh, and I always say that the most important thing is the four legs and the tail yeah. in front of you. And, mm-hmm. and a good trainer will be able to adapt a methodology to, that to get the best dog. out of that dog. Yeah. Have you guys uh, used or been using... Condition reinforced for the marker based system, whether it be audible or whatever. Yeah, so I think we were one of the first police forces back in the day that started using clickers for, yep. for detection work, and we've had some fantastic yeah. success with, with shaping dogs with mm-hmm. clickers mm-hmm. Um, and markers for mm-hmm. you know developing indications and um you know the, the longevity of the indication yes the intensity of the indication and we've done that really successfully with with clicker um we have also done other methods without using sure uh, markers mm-hmm. and, and things like that so some of the kong methodology mm-hmm. We, mm-hmm. we adopt um but again it's down to the dog some dogs benefit yeah. from from clickers yep. and, and uh, markers other dogs will benefit from you know some of the Kong methodology mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. like that, and and I think again it goes back to just adapting to the dog in front of you, um, and yeah. being able to have lots of the key to being a good dog trainer is having lots of tools in your box. You to got it to reel it out, and right, this dog needs this, this dog needs that, this dog needs the other, mm-hmm. and, and that's what we really try and do is is you know look at what we've got in front of us, and and hopefully between our training department, there's somebody with a mm-hmm. a tool and a, and an idea that will work for yeah. the dog. Yeah, no, and that's definitely something that puppies will teach you is oh, yeah. how to be very adaptable <laughs> to uh, what works best. So, yeah. well, I appreciate your time and in, in, in answering the questions. So, and thank you for the tour. No, thanks for coming to, to see us. It's uh, exciting. Yep, I appreciate it.